Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raymond Tate and I want to welcome you into the XBE Thrive series and our topic today very specifically is going to be the 10 biggest challenges for XBEs. Um, as we start to go through a little bit of housekeeping that I wanted to be able to take care of. So because this is virtual, obviously, to be able to, to interact with you all, what we'll need you to do is to be able to go over to the chat section, which will be on your right. If there's any questions that you have or there's a couple of questions that we ask you all to be able to get information, please feel free to be able to fill in that information. And uh, again, this will be kind of a uh, back and forth as we as we go along. Now, one of the things that this is not is that we won't be having live calls coming in into because we want to be respectful of your time and stick to the 45 minutes that we have allotted to this. But again, we will interact with you all by entering into the chat section and we'll answer those in a Q&A that we have at the end. Uh, one of the things that we'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Diversity Consortium. So the Diversity Consortium mission is to uh, really make a true measurable difference in the supplier diversity landscape while providing a return on investment for corporations and XBE organizations while improving the communities in which they operate. This is a, one of the driving focuses that we talk about the mission in terms of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and how we interact with our corporate partners and also with uh, the XBEs, which is you all align. So wanted to give you a little bit of a piece about that. A little bit more about the Diversity Consortium is that uh, we have a collection of partners. Uh, they're the cream of the crop, best of the best, to be able to really enact the services that we that we uh, go through. So really on average, uh, you have 10 plus years in business uh, with our corporate partners. Uh, we have over 500 service lines and I'll make a little bit more sense when I get into service lines a little bit later on down the line. But in essence, what it is, is that these are the services that our partners will be providing to you all as XBEs. And it's a great way for um, you to be able to proliferate, proliferate your business. Say that five times fast. Um, our partners work with thousands of XBEs uh, through their different lines of business and uh, you know there, there are different sections and I'll tell you I'll in the end kind of direct you a little bit more towards uh, the micro webinars that we have that really kind of get specific into these particular areas. Um, we have hundreds of staff members you know one of the things that you have to be able to do is to be able to service you all as XBEs corporate partners and our partners that we use uh, the 25 plus that we have have a number of associates that are in there and they're all highly trained and able to work with uh, you and also our corporate partners. Um, we have a billion in cash reserves across it. We've worked um, on the financial side and we'll talk a little bit about that today, but we also have a, a micro webinar that talks uh, and that's going to be actually held later on today that uh, we use to be able to talk more about the financing side. But in essence, what it is is that there's many different avenues to again help you to proliferate your business and, and there's 25 plus partners that we work into. So many different lines, many different partners to be able to work with as we uh, move forward with you and talk a little bit more about uh, working within your business business. Now, I talked a little bit about this before, and what I wanted to give you was a little bit of an overview of you know, what we offer. So when you look on the left side, you look at what we call the upmarket offerings, and this is what we uh, allot to our corporate partners. So when you start giving advice and we start talking about coaching, those types of things, strategy, program management, research, this is what we afford our corporate partners to really be able to work with and educate them on what we have on the other side, which is the XBEs. Um, and we start talking about down market offerings, Offerings. And this is really where we start to get into uh, dis disadvantaged businesses and what we call XBEs. And if I can, I'll take a quick second. One of the things that uh, the designation of a disadvantaged business uh, is kind of the name that goes out there. What we've done is we've looked at it and we've kind of changed it to a certain extent to encompass everything. So LGBTQ, uh, African-American owned businesses, Latin women owned businesses, it basically takes in everybody into account. And that's why we use the term XBE. And you'll see that throughout the course of this conversation that we'll be having with our uh, speaker that I'll introduce in a few minutes. But when you look at the right side, this really addresses more to the XBE side. So when you start talking about things like, you know, coaching and mentoring, uh, back of house services, business development, uh, working capital, you can see a number of these particular areas. This is the, the lines of service that our partners bring to the table in working with XBEs and again, proliferating their businesses. So as we start to go through a little bit more of this will make sense and we'll flesh it out a little bit more. But the idea is that uh, you could, well, I'll give you contact information at the end so that uh, if you want to find out more about it, you can absolutely get in touch with us and we can go from that standpoint. 
So let's talk a little bit about uh, you know, our service partners and the ones that are uh, helping us and sponsoring with us today. So we have Dobbins International uh, and Diversity Works and Diversity Works, uh, the gentleman that's going to be coming on here in a short period of time, Randall Dobbins. Uh, he is uh, with Diversity Works and uh, we'll kind of flesh out what he does in a couple of minutes. Alliance Experts L LLC uh, coming together for a common goal. Uh, the Plan Consulting Group, uh, which uh, really kind of works with a lot of our platforms, uh, virtual offices, those types of things, uh, does a great job in terms of uh, being one of our partners in there. Diversity Masterminds, really helping XBs go through certification processes, those types of things. And then also the uh, CWE, which is the collaborative work environment. And in essence, what they do is they put up the technology platforms that we use to be able to help XBEs be able to take their businesses to another level. So those are our partners and uh, love that uh, they'll be on the line today and also be able to provide services down the road uh, should it uh, be appropriate for your business. So let's uh, go to the topic. Today's topic is the 10 biggest challenges uh, for XBEs. And so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what your category of your company is. So as we talked about it a little bit before, it was a disabled vi uh, businesses, but we use the term XBE. Want to kind of find out some of the uh, categories that you fall in. Could be women-owned business, could be African-American owned business, 8A, those types of things. Let's uh, take a quick second and get a little bit of the feedback back in the uh, chat room, if you don't mind. Okay, looks like we've got uh, some, we've got women owned business. Great, great. Uh, we've got some African American owned business. That's, that's awesome. Okay, good, good. So we, we, we've got the mix and that's that's really what we want to be able to get a clear understanding because we work with really everybody. And so hopefully through the course of this conversation and some of the other uh, micro webinars that we do, you'll get a good understanding, number one, of what we do, but more importantly, of how we can help you in your business, the evaluation process, leading you down the right path for the services. So it's great that we see a good mix of people that are going to be uh, that, that are attending today. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Diversity Works. And so uh, the gentleman that's going to be our panel speaker, Randall Dobbins, been in business for over 16 years. Uh, and he comes from a very uh, wealthy, let's call it uh, background in terms of executive experience. Um, he's worked very closely and he has a, a strong passion for working with XBEs as, as we talked about it before. His skills have helped them to be able to land large contracts and uh, really be able to, as I keep on saying, proliferate their business. Um, really what he sets up is a framework and really kind of a training process, evaluating your business and really being able to say these are the directions where you know we might be able to give you help to be able to make sure you're positioned correctly for corporate uh, opportunities in there. So when we start talking about that, he's gone through thousands of companies in terms of the way that he's trained. And let me go ahead and get down to Randall Dobbins. The painfully handsome man that you see on the screen right now is going to be uh, kind of my co-pilot today as we start to go through the process of the 10 biggest uh, challenges for the XBEs. Talk a little bit about Randall's business, but one of the things that I think you'll see as we start to go through, the man is very passionate about working with XBEs. And when, when I say that, I mean, I, I don't want it to come across as anything that's, you know, kind Kind of a throwaway you know he really cares about it and i think you'll see that in his work if you're so fortunate to be able to uh you know work with him and work within uh this the strength the framework for which he puts it forward so without further ado randall dobbins uh we're going to talk a little bit about a few things and uh randall if you'd like to please the uh, screen is yours in terms of what we're going to cover today uh raymond, uh, raymond thank, thank you, you. I appreciate, appreciate it, it. We've had a little echo going on here. I'm trying to figure out where that's coming from. All righty. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everyone. Glad you could share some time with us. This is a, a great topic with regard to everything that's been going on in the last 18 months, trying to figure out what the position of your business is, trying to make sure that as we see a lot of the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 actually take this moment and and figure out in their business model how to grow that uh, what we want to talk about for you all is the state of the XBE marketplace. W where's the struggle coming from in landing corporate contracts? What are the challenges? And we're going to wrap it up with the three things that you must do in, in order to continue to position yourself for success in this space uh, as well. 
if uh, you're looking to get into this space to really and truly take your business to uh, the next level, what precisely you must do. And then we're going to follow that up, up with a Q&A session. So um, by all means, grab your pen and paper, start taking some notes and uh, feed those into the Q&A so that we can address your questions and concerns because this is this session is for you. It's a it's a win when we get your questions and we can answer something that can make a difference in your business today. So this is an opportunity for you. And uh, then we'll uh, wrap up with some coming events. Now with that, let me talk about the state of the XBE marketplace. And what we mean by this is what do we see going on in the daily life of companies like yours? And there's two pieces to this. There is what's the piece that is your your day-to-day -day operating issues around you, do you have enough working capital are you getting customer traction are you solving problems for your business versus what's coming at you from the customer base so let's kind of uh because the fortune 500 have their own challenges and their challenges manifest in your business it's kind of like if they get a cold you get the flu <laughs> and so with that let's kind of talk about um, the, the 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 impact of the uh, pandemic on the supply chain. Now, for those of you listening to us at a United in the United States, and you're beginning to begin to understand what the issue is with all of these ships being positioned uh, out in the uh, the port of Long Beach, the port of Los Angeles, and and other places. Uh, you're beginning to see up close and personal with some of these empty store shelves right now, the impact of the pandemic on the supply chain. And there's two primary ones. One is you, you have to see that because all of a sudden a lot of dependency was on manufacturing in China and India, that for all good reason, they took care of their home markets first. And that created a ripple effect every place else, including the United States. If China decided that they were going to allocate medical supplies, like a, a report I saw last night, wheelchairs and um, crutches for their people, that means that for the first time in the history of the United States, we may not have enough wheelchairs and crutches for our own need. <laughs> and so what we're looking at here is you can pick any industry the the chip industry with automobiles uh we're looking at potential store shelf shortages for christmas items for toys we're seeing some issues with uh food where some of the raw materials for food are brought in from other countries so this creates a huge challenge for the fortune 500 that these are problems they have to solve right now because not solving the problem creates two huge issues which we have a role to help solve the two huge issues are they don't have product, and if they don't have product, they're losing out on sales. So if we can actually step in and help out, then what that means is that creates huge opportunity for us. We also have this issue with social justice, diversity, and inclusion, which is creating a, a fantastic opportunity for us to even have a bigger impact and I, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this because there's a number of folks that participate in the government space uh, and we're not talking about the government space in, in this particular um, session here. Uh, the consortium does support suppliers going after the government's government space. There is an impact, but I want to be specific about this in the Fortune 1000 space. Diversity and inclusion amongst them now has a profit motive. It has a shareholder motive. It has a stakeholder motive. What they have figured out is that if their customer base is 70% women and minorities, 50% women definitionally, 70% women and minorities, then it is in their survival. It is in their growth. It is in their best interest to ensure that number one, their employee base is as reflective as their customer base as, as practical and their supply base better well look like their customer base <laughs> because when they do that, they get solutions better than they've ever gotten before. They see it now. And so 
the whole impact of the social justice, diversity and inclusion issue is not that they have a mandate that they must uh, hit a certain amount of revenue with suppliers. It is their shareholders, their stockholders, their stakeholders. Everyone sees that if they are actually looking to stay in business, this is something that they need to do because it drives sales and revenue for them. The other issue is uh, the 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 remaining three and the, the the second one actually more so than 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 the other two. Technology, the speed of technology is coming so fast that a lot of them are finding that when their competitor adopts a technology, that they get left behind. And then with um, the sourcing of personnel right now coming out of the pandemic, we have a labor shortage. Uh, between 1970 and right now, 5% of there's there's 5% less men in the labor force than there used to be. And that's that age group between 18 to, to 55. And that historically has been an economic driver for the United States. Now, this is probably affecting your business as well. You probably are looking at increased diversity and inclusion requirements for your business. You're looking at trying to figure out which technologies make sense in your business. You're probably trying to find people because we do know in the pandemic that a lot of XBEs, especially under 50 million, were hard hit uh, for a whole host of reasons. And some of your people may not be coming back to work if they weren't declared essential. Or you're having to give signing bonuses now because they're finding jobs that pay more money with some of the bigger companies. And so this is a huge issue for you. And then when we get into the diversity spend itself, uh, along with the big companies realizing that they've done a poor job at it previously, they're now trying to figure out how do they actually direct more money to XBEs. And it isn't that they weren't willing to do it previously, it was at what risk? because they're not going to put their business at risk to to do business with suppliers that aren't ready. And then the other issue in the marketplace is this this notice of uh, this issue of certification. One of the things we know is probably less than 3% of all XBEs have gone through the process of certification for a couple of different reasons. One being they they don't uh, want to be recognized in the marketplace just because they happen to have a, a specific status and 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 I want to put a fork in the ground around this right right this minute. Um, certification will not get you business. All right, just because you are an MBE, just because you are WBE, just because you are XBE in the Fortune 1000 will not get you a dollar of business. What it will do is all things being equal. If you have a competitive price, you've got com uh, competitive features and benefits, you've got com uh, competitive quality to your uh, to your to your competitors, then it is one heck of a tiebreaker. And uh, we, we, we have one of our service partners that actually specializes in this, and I love the way she says it. Certification, additionally, not only is it a fantastic tiebreaker, it gets it gives you a side door uh, to potentially skip in line to get access to folks if you know how to use it. So a lot of you that are not getting value out of your certification, you may want to rethink what was the purpose of getting the certification and are you actually using it to drive more opportunities for you and put you in a position where you can get that tiebreaker where your certification gives you the uh, gets you a contract. Anything you want to add to that, Raymond? I think you're you're muted. Wanted to kind of ask you a little question about, uh, you know, we start talking about the education of the marketplace. So when you start talking about, you know, the corporate side, you know, having the social injustice, diversity, inclusion, you know, for a lot of businesses, this is something to where they said, OK, you know what, we've got to make a change. How do you feel like the education of that is going along? Because, I mean, you've lived it from that side of the business. You've seen it from this side of the business. Any, you know, particular things or any particular insight that you wanted to be able to add in terms of, uh, you know, kind of looking at how corporate looks at the business differently and how they look at XPs? Absolutely. Great question, because I have somewhat of a, I don't want to call it a contrarian point of view. Um, to me, this is a, a continuation of an existing argument 
and, and, and I mean that definitionally, argue for, for those of you that are familiar with this, it's convincing the other person that you're right. <laughs> a, a dialogue is a sharing of information and trying to get to a right, a, 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 a good workable solution. What I have seen is um, there's been an argument and a conversation and conversation is very similar to argument. Neither of those uses the Greek word dia, meaning to like dialogue. And, and I, I want to crystallize on this because it's going to set the stage for what, what we do moving forward. The argument, the conversation is from the corporate perspective that XBEs aren't ready to do business. They don't know the industry. They don't know the customer's business and the customer isn't um, uh, convinced that they can handle the contract if they got it. And, and I need you all uh, on this call to put yourself in the same position as the corporate buyer when you think about the suppliers you buy from, from, from your business. Do you use staples? Do you go to Amazon? Do you have any questions when you pick your suppliers as to whether or not they're gonna be there for you today or tomorrow? So that's one side of the argument or the conversation. The flip side from the XBE side is they aren't serious about doing business with me. They aren't serious about doing business with people who look like me. <laughs> they, they, uh, they don't understand what we can really do because um, they're only providing lip service to this and a whole host of other things. And there's never any common ground between those two points. And so for me, where, where I believe uh, what we're talking about in this conversation and where I believe the opportunity that the consortium and, and everyone else is and what I challenge XBEs on is, are you convinced that you've learned and identified the skills you need to play in this game? And uh, I, I really hate uh, going with sports metaphors, but right now we're 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 in the World Series for for baseball. We're coming up with a Super Bowl, uh, a whole host of things. The Fortune 500, the Fortune 1000, they they have a World Series game every day. They go to market. They got a Super Bowl game every day. What they're picking is who are the players, who's on that team, and what do they need to do to win. And we have a group of XBEs, oftentimes that have. Um, uh, hadn't gone through the farm team. They 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 hadn't had their rookie season yet. They hadn't gotten to the top tier of the sport, and they're going. I I'm ready to play in the Super Bowl. And it's like, you know what? You may need to have some more reps with the practice squad. You might need to get a trainer or a coach or someone to work with you to help you, you know, increase your speed and your your swing speed and your batting average and all these other kinds of things, so that when your jersey is called, when it's your time to play, you can hit the ground running, knowing that you can contribute to the success of that team. And a lot of uh, information that has been, been uh, that, that's necessary about what you need to compete in this game has never been shared before. Why? Because the people who know it don't want to tell you. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to get to, uh, you know, and, and we'll flesh that out a little bit more as we go through. But I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, you know, educating folks on, as I said from the beginning, proliferating your business. How do you do it? And we're going to get to that with some of the challenges as we start to go on. So thank you, Randall. All right. Let us go to the next. So um, we talked about, you know, what are some of the uh, things? Why do XBE struggle to land corporate contracts? And I think you touched a little bit on this uh, before, Randall, but one of the biggest things that we talked about is, you know, size. You know, you're going to hear this a lot is, you know, my business is too small. That's one of the biggest ones that come out there. And we'll talk about some of the challenges, but these are some of the uh, kind of overarching uh, things that we see out there. You know, have you scaled your business correctly? Um, you know, what's the scope of the business that's going to be coming in that you're actually bidding on? You know, are there biases that are out there? Let's call it what it is. I mean, you know, it could be, you know, the way that you look. It's the way that you, uh, you know, go about, you know, business. Are you qualified? These are things that are biases that we all have as humans. And of course, from a corporate standpoint, that's what you're looking at. Then, of course, the risk, you know, when you start to get it, is it perceived or real? And Randall touched on that a little bit earlier, and we'll get a chance to kind of flesh that out as we start to get a little bit further into it. Randall, we want to talk a little bit about the uh, corporate supply chain and uh, kind of the review so that uh, we can kind of give them a little bit of detail before we get into big picture. Absolutely. And uh, just on the, the, the quickly on the last two bullets you mentioned, 
uh, I do want to make sure that I put a fork in the in the ground on this one, which is uh, around bias. I would say uh, 30 years ago, 70% of the reason why companies like yours didn't get business is because you were companies like yours. I would say in 2021, probably only 30% of the reason why you're not getting contracts is because of, so it's like the, the bias is real, but it, uh, what I would tell you, and I tell you this, when I start looking at things like the billion dollar round table, when I tell you things I'm seeing firsthand, when I see people getting contracts, I can tell you for a fact, more companies like yours are getting contracts today than were 30 years ago. We, we've got our first um, uh, 11, $12 billion company public that we know of worldwide technologies. Um, and, and the owner of that company is actually in the uh, top 10 billionaires in, in the world. OK, we, we, we know these things are happening and it's not just happening to a handful of folks. It's happening to a lot of folks. So if if you believe that that bias is holding your business back, then there I, I would suggest to you there may be some other things at play where you can work around that bias or you can pick different markets or there's a different way you can go. It's not monolithic that all of the companies are conspiring against you. And the risk is quite frankly, and 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 Raymond, we can go to the next slide on this. The risk is I'm not going to put my supply chain uh, at risk for any supplier. All right. I mean, think about this if you're at and and you 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 have a a service provider that's responsible for the uh, cell tower maintenance. Are you going to put that cell tower potentially not operating at risk because you picked the wrong supplier to work on it? And the answer is no. Let me help you with that. If if you're spending a lot of time thinking about that, the answer is no. <laughs> and so what we're talking about. Uh, under manage, managing risk, corporations have done a lot of work over the years uh, between this slide and the next slide to start thinking about their business, how they organize what they buy, how do they drive efficiency, what's the strategy that maps with each particular segment of their business that drives the, the, the performance they're looking for, the cost they're looking for, and the results they're looking for, and then how do they then match that with the suppliers that can can, can play in this space? And so, yes, there, there's a distinction between supply chain purchasing and procurement. There's a distinction between planned and unplanned spin. There's a distinction between direct spin and indirect spin. Uh, there's a distinction with commodity segmentation. On the next page, um, there's a, a, an issue of the evolution of procurement with regard to when you have conversations with different folks, how do you identify where they are in the evolution of procurement? What does that mean to what you are bringing to market? How do you price your products relative to that? What is the competitive environment? What is the significance of whether what you sell is purchased at a home office versus a field or plant? What, how is a buyer going to respond to you and your business and how much are they going to beat you up in a negotiation? <laughs> never happens, Randall. Never, never happens. happens. Never happens. <laughs> and actually, it's just sparring. They're not going to beat you up. You got to be able to give as well as you take, though, just just so you know, that's the nature of the game. Um, whether it's something that they're doing strategically or tactically and then you know, if you're interested in contracts two through 200, not just contract number one, how do, how do you configure your business so that you can be in there for continuous improvement? And oh, by the way, the number one thing that you got to come across is, you, you know, just, just like us, all right, if we've got somebody we've been doing business with for a while, it costs us money to unplug them and plug somebody new in. So then when we start talking about the switching costs, how do you then go through and figure out in those switching costs, what does it take to uh, above and beyond the cost to unplug somebody else. What is the, the business case or the justification for bringing somebody new in? So you got to understand all of that in terms of how you price and what you're offering. Agreed. I mean, and when you start talking about those costs, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, going through and the switching costs, it's time and it's, you know, money in those cases. And that's that's a big deal. So, you know, you can say, OK, how much is, you know, my time going to be put into that? And that can influence a decision as it starts to get through. So good, good insight in terms of what's there. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and let's transition into the uh, biggest challenges for the uh, XBE. So, uh, Randall, you want to talk a little about certification? 
Uh, absolutely. And and for everyone's benefit, you, you know, we spent a little bit of time giving you a preview of the supply chain because that's where you play. And each one of those supply chains has specific strategies that has an impact on your business and the opportunities available for your business. So as we look at the 10 biggest challenges, what we're hearing from our folks uh, are things like, hey, you, you know, we went and we got this certification. Where are the contracts coming from? And that goes back to the issue that we talked about earlier. It is um, in, in with the Fortune 1000, they they are looking for folks who are certified, but your certification is one of many uh, components in the evaluation process. And in some cases, they are specifically looking for folks who have certifications. So if you have not certified, uh, what I would tell you, what I would suggest to you is it's better for you to have the certification and not use it rather than not having the certification and missing out on opportunities that could very well only be given to folks who they can identify because they they, they are known to be certified. So uh, the issue there is we would say it's better to have the certification and then make yourself visible. The, our whole industry as buyers, I mean, as sellers, is making sure people know we're out there and what we do. And if we're not taking advantage of getting our megaphone uh, dialed up to 10 by by announcing that we have our certification, we're doing a disservice to to our to ourselves, and we're depriving some some customers of some great innovation that we can bring forward. Uh, one of the other questions we're getting from folks around how do you scale your business to get corporate contracts? That's kind of been what we've been talking about for the last 10 or 15 minutes. You, you know, you scale your business by identifying the skills gap that's costing you money. So once you know what those skills are, then you start closing them and you'll start seeing that you, the opportunities come your way primarily because your conversation changes. When you have these skills, your conversation changes, you lower the perceived risk that a corporate buyer has in doing business with your company. And you can show them concretely and objectively where you've been able to demonstrate the results you are promising for others. And they know, oh, you did that for my competitor? Come on in. And then with regard to the pipeline, the the situation here and this is a killer condition no no seller wants to be in this position and quite frankly no buyer wants to be in this position oftentimes the nature of your business has it where your revenues are really strong in one period and really weak uh in, in another and you find yourselves in these hiring and 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 um uh, staff re and layoff periods uh or you find that your 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 business uh, one customer is responsible for 80 or 90 percent of your business. And, you, you know, if 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 they actually come, come back and, and, and start cutting back on your their business, that you, you're all of a sudden in trouble. Just briefly as a quick story. Uh, one of the things you learn is in, in, in buying is you're not really a buyer until you're sued. The first time I got sued as a buyer was from an XBE in St. Louis we were doing business with 90% of her business was with the company that I worked for. We went from a local strategy to a national strategy. She didn't have a national solution for us. And so her business was at risk. And she sent letters to the CEO at that time. It was the largest company of the world in, in the world. So his name, the general manager for my business unit and me were all named in the lawsuit. But I'm sitting back and I'm looking at this as a buyer. And this is one of those things that we teach is it was her fault that she ran her business with 80 to 90 percent of her revenue dependent on one customer. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, it, and, that, and it's a great story. I mean, a great story because you got sued, but it's a great story in terms of being able to solidify it and maybe we'll get a clear understanding of you've constantly got to be looking at other opportunities and that comes into being prepared. Think about the uh, the bullet that's above that. How did you scale your business? You know, did you go with the flow? Did you make sure that you had, you know, some of the singles and doubles and not worrying about, you know, the home run every time that you have there? You've got to be able to make sure that your business is constantly moving and growing for that. So I think it's a, it's a great story to be able to, to uh, talk about it. Let's talk about uh, partnering. Uh, this is, I, I know, something near and dear to your heart, uh, Randall. If you could give kind of an understanding of, you know, really the concept of partnering and really, you know, how can they go about, uh, you know, moving that forward? 
F- funny story the, the the tags along the conversation with the the lady in St. Louis was she did not win the lawsuit. In case anybody's wondering, she did not lose the. So I don't recommend you start suing buyers. <laughs> And one of the things that she failed to do, which is when we put our national solution together, what we did in the national solution in the the solution that we did for the the national agreement was we got six companies to come together to put together a solution that one company could not offer on their own. And so when we start talking about partnering and where do you find one, the first thing that we want you to, to make sure we, you understand, and, and you can write this down, all right? Randall said, the, the, the longest and most expensive way to go out of business is to go it alone. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Write this down. Going it alone is the longest and most expensive way to go out of business. In 2021, we are in the partner economy. We're seeing the big boys partner, all right? Not buy one another, partner, all right? We are seeing them partner. And the idea being we're in the partner economy because people realize that they can't be the best at everything. So if they know what they're good at and they know what somebody else is good at and they know what a third person is good at and they figure out how to come together and they can present that as one solution to the marketplace, then they've got a bigger footprint, they've got more capacity, they have more capabilities, and they're bringing the best of what each company individually does to a corporate client that is sorely in desperate need of this kind of innovation. So when it comes to where do you begin to find them, once you understand that's a good model for the for the future of your business, then you start looking at what does a solution look like for my customer set and who are other people that offer the things that I don't do? And you can specifically uh, talk to some of your um, local advocacy, uh, advocacy councils, the Gay Lesbian Council, the Chambers of Commerce, um, the uh, we, we Bank and um, Disability Inn and uh, NMSDC and a whole host of other folks. Um, you clearly can talk to the Divor- Div- uh, Diversity Consortium about this and whatnot. Um, because the idea is you you want to find folks that are really good and bring something to the table that you cannot and should not do on your own. It's a it's a great piece to it because you know we talked a little bit earlier about cost and time. You know what is it that they're looking for? So when you're bringing together all of those different uh, you know facets, things that may be perceived as weaknesses in your you know proposal. In that case, if somebody else can bring that to the table for you, you've taken that objection off the table. You know, saying that bias, okay, your business can't do that. So love uh, the idea of doing that partnering, and uh, I'm sure there'll be questions uh, to that effect later. Um, All right, let's move on to uh, little to no funding options for growth. And I'm going to go ahead and say this, and this is probably a big one, this whole money thing, uh, you know, I understand it's important. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about that, uh, Randall, in terms of, you know, options for growth. Once again, you pick the right partner and uh, that will address some of your limited funding options for growth. Uh, what I will tell you right now, and for some of you is like, geez, Randall, why didn't you tell me this earlier? But it's like, this is why we're having this conversation right now. It's because no one told you this. The best time for you to secure working capital and financing options is when the business is good. Do not wait for business to be bad to try and figure out how do you position yourself for uh, financial wherewithal and reserves. Uh, So one of the things through the consortium, and once again, this is not a sales pitch, this is just information you need to know, is there are uh, alternative financing options and other kinds of things are available to you where uh, you can actually begin to start working through these kinds of issues right this very minute to position yourself. And the reason this is important is one of one of the major issues that a corporation has in figuring out if they're going to do contracts, uh, do a contract with you, award a contract to you, is whether or not they believe you have financial wherewithal to handle the contract. So if you haven't done this work, if you don't already have it built in, if you're not sitting on a grip of cash right now, this is a skills gap that you need to close ASAP. 
very good. Uh, and just so you know, grip is an absolutely technical term uh, that uh, Rachel was talking about. <laughs> so, like I said, he's, he's absolutely right. You got to make sure that grip. you punch him back. Grip. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's go on to the next one. Um, this is a big one. I mean, this this comes across this and as many times as, you know, we talk with XBEs, this is probably the one that comes to the front uh, quite often is my company is too small. Want to expound on that a little bit, Randall? A absolutely. And, and I need you to be honest with yourself. Your company may be too small from a big company's perspective. Uh, and and let, let me let me let me just be succinct about this. Um, you might be perceived too small if you have a hundred thousand dollar a year annual revenues and you're asking somebody for a million dollar contract. Wait, Randall, that number doesn't work <laughs> out. Can you tell me why? <laughs> well, one of the things when I was a buyer that was an issue was people would walk up to me and say, "Hey, how, how do I do business with you? You know, your big old." And I'll tell you, I worked for Shell Oil Company. How 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 do we do business with? Uh, your company. And it's like when I go and pull a D&B on your company and I, I look at, uh, you, you know, the, the the contract you're asking me for, it's it's like there's no way that I'm going to to give you a, um, a $100,000 contract if you're a $100,000 business. And I might look at your business as a $100,000 business and I might say, you know what, if I think you might have a good business, I might test it on like a $5,000 opportunity just to see what you do with it. But depending on what's on my desk right then that, that particular day, I may not have any $5,000 opportunities. Everything that hit my desk may be $50,000, $100,000, $5 million, $10 million and above. Okay. But the, the issue there, when you the, the question around whether or not you're too small, the real question is, have I sufficiently proved my business out with enough customers before I even approach somebody like a Shell, a General Motors, a General Electric, a Microsoft, or so forth and so on. So when you look at your, your current revenues and you start looking through what types of business you should be looking at, ask yourself, do I need to be going after the Fortune 1000 right now? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to look at it. I mean, you know, again, it's setting your own expectation of what's there because you're going to spend all that time chasing the shells those big ones when you can really be working on your track record you know what what is somebody as a supplier is a uh, buyer look at and say you know okay here's where you've been here's how you've grown here's who i can call to be able to talk into it that's the kind of story that you need to be able to tell beyond just the numbers and if that's strong much better shot to be able to get into it so i appreciate that randall um this one comes up quite often as well as i am good at operating my business but i need help running my business and that really starts to talk about some of the things that are behind the scenes you know so not everybody is a hundred percent accountant right so when we start talking about the the back of the house stuff can you talk a little bit about uh, people that you know can be absolutely great about you know working and operating their business but you know maybe not good in some of the other areas there's a uh, two sides to that coin, and I'm going to kind of wrap this up with with uh, the, the 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 remaining uh, bullets on on this on this uh, slide. There, there's an issue of um, the flip side of the coin. If you are good at running the business um, b b because you you operate your business, then you may need to hire somebody um, that it, that that should be doing all the other stuff. And if you are good at being the face of the business uh, and you need to be out there driving the direction and the future of the business, then you might need to get some resources to do all the other stuff. You can't do both. <laughs> uh, all right. A, a lot of people feel like they can, but I'm going to tell you right now, you, you're, if you're doing both, it's at the expense of one or the other. And depending on where your business is right now, you really and truly need to make a decision around where is the best use of your time and your key resources. Is the best use of that driving the growth of the business and making sure that operationally you're keeping up? <clears throat> or is it uh, focusing on, because you've got quality issues and you've got service delivery issues, making sure that you're putting something worthwhile and significant out in the marketplace so that uh, people actually trust that you can deliver on the promises that you've made. Now, for XBEs, most actually spend more time dealing, uh, working in the business and not on the business. And you need to stop doing that as quickly as 
possible. You need to start looking at options that uh, allow you to do two things. One, get a better level of proficiency in the parts of the business that are not core. And secondly, um, allows you to divert resources that you have in the organization doing the things that aren't really driving revenue for you. So if you can divert the resources and if, if you can improve the capabilities of those activities, you now have actually positioned your company for dramatic growth. 10X is a very realistic opportunity for your business if you do those two things. It begins to address the issue around uh, finessing your techniques to get your foot in the door. It begins to make sure you're focusing on getting the professional RFP responses. And then it gives you the mindset, the space, and the understanding to look at, you know, once you've won the contract, how do you now begin to deliver? Because the killer condition there is you do not want to fall flat on your face once you did all the work to getting a contract and then not be able to perform. No, and, and that's very true. And I mean, the one thing that, uh, you know, you talked about uh, briefly was the professional RFP response. It's the first thing that people look at. It's not just the pricing page on the back, uh, you know, of the package that you submit there. It's got to look smooth. It's got to be, you know, everything's got to be spelled right. Uh, you know, you can't have things running outside of the margin. That's the per that's perception of what your company is. So this really gets into it. And, you know, Randy, I think you hit the nail on the head on all of those topics. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, the three things that uh, you must uh, do to be successful. And I know that you, you have a little bit of a setup in terms of getting there. So floor is yours, my good man. Thank you, sir. So what, what I want everyone to take away from this slide is, you know, we talked previously about getting your foot in the door. We talked previously about understanding supply chain strategy, the different ways that corporations in, in managing their business, how does that actually translate to opportunities for you? Uh, and, and you probably heard it, but you just dismissed it because it didn't match with your reality. You, you hear buyers and people in corporations say there's opportunities everywhere. Well, I'm going to echo that sentiment. There's opportunities everywhere. <laughs> The if you're not getting them, then there might be a skills deficit and there might be a knowledge deficit around where to look for them. So what you're looking at here in this matrix is there are no less than 36 different ways in which you can get your foot in the door, how you configure your business, what your pitch needs to be. And yes, you need to have a specific pitch based on which one or combination of these 36 opportunity areas you go for. It's a function of how large your company is, how large the opportunity is, how much impact it's gonna have with, with a corporate. But if you tell me there aren't any opportunities for you in this market, then I would tell you that um, you might be missing some information on how to actually position your company for success in this market because it can be done. People are doing it every day. <laughs> Very good. All right, so let's and get to with, those three. Let's get to those three. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and, and, and with that, to maximize those opportunities, I'm going to simplify this down to three basic things that you really need to do. Uh, and you can argue with them and you can stay out in the wilderness as long as you like. You know, hopefully your revenues and cash flow supports that. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to do three basic things. There's a there's some work to, to do to get there and there's support for you to help do that work. But it's, it's really three simple things. One, you need to figure out how to partner, how to do strategic alliances to address the capacity requirement. Because when people are telling you that you're too small, they're basically saying, I don't believe you can handle the contract. You don't have capacity. All right. The second thing is you need to make sure you have a process that can deliver year over year performance. And now if your business is only set up to go after one off contracts, then you don't have to deal with this. But if you're trying to actually get in this game and win what you want or blanket purchase orders, you want three year contracts uh, that are sizable and grow. And in order to maintain those, you have to figure out how to deliver year over year or continuous improvement. And that means that you've got a repeatable process that actually addresses performance both in your company and in the supplier, in the customer's organization. And then the third thing is you need to actually have a solution, which once again gets us back to what strategic alliances do. And it's the difference between a product and a solution. 
uh, it, it, in some cases, a product is all you need. In other cases, a solution is what you need. All right. And, 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 and Jiffy Lube is a great example. We used to go to Jiffy Lube just to get an oil change. Now you go to Jiffy Lube and it's like, well, hey, you want your air filter change? You want your fuel filter change? You want me to uh, check the fluids uh, for, for you want me to wash your windshields? It's now a full service things, which means that you're not going to get the battery at one place. You're not going to get an oil change at one place. You're not going to get windshield wiper fluid at another. I mean, they, they brought a solution to the market. And so for your business, once again, what does a solution look like for you? And uh, how do you then use that to drive innovation in your customer's business? You know, Randall, that's great because, I mean, you look at these things and, and all three, it's very focused, right? You know, to be able to look at it. These are the things that you can ask yourself right now as an XBE to say, OK, how do I need to get to the next level? And these things absolutely say if you if you feel like you haven't covered these or if you feel like you need help with that, that's the conversation that you need to be honest with yourself and say, OK, let's see what the next steps are going to be in that case. So great information. All right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to transition over to q and A. I'm going to be as respectful as I can for uh, time uh, here, but um, love the content um, that was provided. So, Adam, if you are there, if we can take a couple of questions. Yeah, we do have a handful of questions. Um, our first one, uh, is there any further insight you can provide from a corporate view on how they look for XBEs? I, I can take that and, and I do need to apologize to everyone. I get passionate about this and I get passionate getting a little long winded. So for those of you that are hanging in with us, I do appreciate you. And uh, we're, we're not going to pay you your regular fee. So don't think you're going up <laughs> for this time frame. So go, go ahead, man. <laughs> so the, the selection process is pretty ex ex extensive. Um, and, and I want to be clear on this. There's not one separate uh, selection process for XBEs uh, to non XBEs. So let, let, let's 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 just put that aside. As a corporate buyer, I have a requirement uh, for a certain skill set, level of performance, uh, product capability, service capability from any supplier. Uh, what, what I am doing right now is that because historically XBEs may not have been on my radar. XBEs may not have been known to me. XBEs did not use the same marketing channels. XBEs perhaps didn't do a whole host of other things because I want to make sure that I get the best suppliers. I now have to go the extra step to make sure that to, to, if for any reason XBEs have not been on my radar, what do I need to do to get them on my radar and make sure that I evaluate them apples to apples with whomever it is I'm going after. Therefore, I will set up groups called supplier diversity and other groups that uh, who, whose charter it is to help me to identify the universe of XBEs that I might otherwise not avail myself to, not because I'm doing it out of social responsibility, which might have been the reason I did it 20 years ago, but because I do know that there's a group of folks that are bringing solutions that are not currently in my company and they can potentially drive more value and more savings than I even knew. And I know this because I've seen it happen all over the world. It's not by accident that I went to Mexico for suppliers 40 years ago. It's not by accident I went to China. I don't have to go to all these places right now because I can go in my own backyard if I'm in the US. <laughs> Very good, very good. Adam, uh, you got another one for us? Yeah, the next question is, I'm interested in getting my employees training on answering the RFPs. Do you provide this live or is this online training? Both. Um, there, there's, a, there's the do-it-yourself model, there is the um, done with you model, and there's the done for you model. So uh, it's just a function of uh, what what do you need, when do you need it, and um, uh, how 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 what level of urgency does does it need to be in your organization? So yes, very good. Let's take uh, one more, and for the ones that we can't go through, um, we'll make sure that we get those questions answered. Please feel free to submit them in the room, and we'll get those taken care of. Let's do one more, Adam. All right. Um, what is a realistic time frame 
for me to ramp up my business? Can I do it in a year? Okay, now that one is, it, it depends. <clears throat> it depends on what is your business, uh, which, which market you're in, uh, what, what products and services are you providing, uh, and what level of skill set do you currently have? Uh, what I generally tell folks, and, and this is based on the the folks that I've trained, the thousands of companies that have come through through our uh, platform, it is you should premise 18 to 36 months. And the reason I tell them that is it has less to do with your business as it is. How long does it take for you to get on a corporation's radar? How long uh, before they get comfortable that you are somebody that uh, they think can work in their system and uh, how long does it take for the process to play out before they give you an award now yes um, that can be done in less than 90 days i want to be clear with everyone that can be done in less than 90 days if the stars line up that can be done in less than 30 days if the stars line up but you can't premise your business on the stars lining up all right and, and, and so um, I, I would say if you set a goal to 2x or 10x your business in the next 12 months, then it can be done, uh, but you will have some discoveries around where your real target market is in that time period. OK, because your real target market might not be the Fortune 500. It might be the 500 to 750 or the 750 to 1000. And between the 750 to 1000, their speed of decision making is a whole lot faster than the 500. So if you're making a commitment to close the skills gap you need to play in that market, then what I would tell you is in 12 months time, you will be significantly farther ahead than you are today, if that's a decision you make today. That's great insight, Randall, because, you know, we talked about what's the journey, right? And, you know, how are you going to get to that level? And you may not be ready. This comes into, you know, is your business small? Those types of things, you know, work into it, build up your journey so that when you get to the Fortune 500, for, Fortune 1000, you're prepared. You have a track record and people can say, OK, you delivered, you know, in a pinch. I had this, these stories, these compelling stories that make your business, you know, come to life as opposed to just being number on a paper. So love the insight. I absolutely love it. Well, and, and the, the only other thing I would add to that, Raymond, uh, just quickly is uh, and we didn't get into this that much, but there are specific types of contracts that you can ask for that may come sooner than the um, blanket purchase order that we talked about, the multi-year deals. There are opportunities out there every day where you can actually get those within the 30-day window, and you can actually string a number of those together. We call them three bids and a buy. Those are spot purchase orders. Those you can get quickly, but um, you, you build a relationship over time with those, and that might be the smartest, best answer for your business um, uh, uh, immediately, but you still have to have the skills to make it happen. You know what? I smell a topic for another uh, thrive. You just put it on the on the radar there. So <laughs> make sure you tune back in in 2022 to be able to go through some of these. But I think that'd be a great topic to be able to give people, you know, really realistic expectations as as it goes down. So thank you, Randall, for that. Um, let me kind of uh, go through and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we have coming up on the horizon here. So this, as you see, is what we call our Thrive um, series in terms of what, uh, how we go come to the market and give information and educate. So you just went through the uh, 10 biggest challenges for XBEs. Was a great session, in my opinion, in terms of being able to provide information and you know give you a little bit more. And the reason why you know Randall does such a great job with it is that you know he's giving you perspective from being in that position. Um, and so you know you can kind of see what you need to do with your business. Business. So thank you, Randall, for that. Um, we have coming up on November 23rd, uh, the opportunity uh, identification. So as we start going through and you're looking at, uh, you know, again, proliferating your business, you know, where do you get those opportunities from? How do you make sure that you're going to be qualified for them? those types of things? That's going to be coming up on November 23rd. Pursuant to this meeting, what we're going to send out to you is just notification uh, to be able to give you that information. And so that uh, you can register, reminder, the whole nine to be able to get into there. And we'd love to be able to have you next time. Then when you come coming up uh, December 21st, 
We're making sure that we're not going to get in your way of your uh, Christmas shopping and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. By the way, make sure that you get computer chips. If you're going to get your computer, get it now because there's a shortage. But the point is, December 21st, uh, it's going to be the power of aligning. And we start talking about that can be through partnerships, those types of things. So powerful stuff on the horizon as we start to move forward. And what we also do is we do micro topics and the difference between the thrives and the micro topics. This is kind of uh, the information that we give to kind of flesh out some of the service lines that uh, we work with XBE. So when you start talking about technology marketing, this is kind of diving deeper into the uh, kind of the surface level topics that I showed you before. Um, so this really kind of gets in a little bit deeper and we have subject matter experts that oversee that, as you can see to the right. What I'll direct you to for the dates on those is to be able to go to our website site, thediversityconsortium.com, to be able to go in there and to be able to find out what the times are. Please register, and uh, like I said, we'll, we'll get you uh, set up for those particular meetings. We have come to the end of our time, and as always, parting is such sweet sorrow. Um, if you need to be able to contact somebody, you can see my information. My name, again, is Raymond Tate. I'm the Vice President of Sales for the Diversity Consortium. You see my telephone number down there, my email address where you can contact me very correctly. And what I'll be able to do is to be able to direct you to our plethora of subject matter experts that can help you to be able to proliferate your business down the road. So having said that, Absolutely appreciate your time. You know how to contact us for the questions that we weren't able to answer or in the time frame that we have here. We'll make sure that we get back to you as quickly as possible. So again, appreciate your time. Thanks for, thanks for joining in.